like to call to order the Board of Directors for Dr. Cog, Wednesday, March 20th. And uh, now would you all joining me to uh, give the Pledge of Allegiance? I think I got everyone's attention. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Oh, we're spunky tonight. <laughs> Connie, can you give us roll call, please? Eva Henry, Steve Odoricio, Present. Jeff Baker, Bill Holland, Here. Here. Chris Jones, Here. David Beacom, Here. Andy Wheelock, <laughs> Nicholas Williams, Here. Kevin Flynn, Jolyn Clark, Roger Partridge, Laura Thomas, Ron Angles, Libby Zabo, Casey Ty, Bob Pfeiffer, Here. Bob Roth, Here. Larry Vidham, David Spellman, Aaron Brockett, Here. Margo Ramsden, Lynn Baca, Here. Roger Hudson, Ben Price, Here. George Teal, Tammy Maurer, Here. Jeremy Fay, Katie Brown, Russell Stewart, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Jackie Thomas, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Linda Olson, Cheryl Wink, Bill Gipp, Here. Daniel Dick, Present. Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Pat Norquist, Storm Gore, Jim Dale, Here. Ron Rakowski, George Lance, Here. Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Anna Goodwine, Jacob LeBure, Here. Karina Elrod, Here. Larry Strzok, Jacob Lofgren, Wynne Shaw, Here. John Peck, Here. Ashley Stolzman, Here. Connie Sullivan, Barney Drystadt, Joyce Palazuski, Paul Sutton, Here. Chris Larson, Here. Julie Mullica, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Dave Black, Andy Hammerly, Here. Jessica Sandgren, Here. Herb Atchison, John Voles, Bud Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Bill Van Meter. Here. Thank you, Connie. Uh, we also want to welcome new alternates. Uh, is it uh, Dennis Maloney, council member from city of Louisville? Here. Okay. And also Dave Black, council member of the city of Sheridan. Okay, we'll give him a round of applause anyways, thanks. <laughs> Next up, uh, move to approve the agenda. All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed say nay. Abstentions, that's passed. The agenda is approved. Now we're gonna move into item number five, the public hearing on uh, public engagement plan. But now I got to read this long script. Good evening. Yes. And so. Is she here? Place. And her name is Rebecca White. Oh, is she here? I there she is. I didn't see her. Thank you, Miss Maurer. Um, good point. Uh, if you haven't noticed, uh, Deborah Perkins Smith from CDOT has retired, and the new uh, planning director, DTD, is Rebecca White, and she's right back. Wave. So we want to welcome her because she'll be coming on board when she gets, I think, some confirmation from the governor, right? I think that's the process. So, Rebecca White. So let's just welcome her now, but she'll be here in a week. Thank you, Director Maurer. All right, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Bob Pfeiffer, chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments. I thank you all for coming tonight. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on the public engagement plan. This public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the public engagement plan to provide comments to the board. 
No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight uh, related to this public hearing. Receiving public comment is, an important, is important to the board's decision-making process. Anyone wishing to speak uh, should first register on the sign-in sheet. Is this it? Sign-in sheet on the table at the back of the room or should have uh, previously made a request to speak through the Dr. Cog website or by phone. All comments received via email, Dr. Cog's website, or in writing have been automatically included in the public hearing record. Comments received prior to this public hearing have been provided to the board. If you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please give it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those who testify. Tonight, Steve Erickson and Lisa Howd of Dr. Cog's staff will now summarize the proposed plan. Thank you, Mr. Chair and directors of the Dr. Cog Board and members of the public. My name is Steve Erickson. I'm the Division Director of Communications and Marketing here at Dr. Cog. And rather than doing that tag team uh, PowerPoint thing, I'm going to allow Lisa Hood um, to present just a few slides that summarize uh, our new public engagement plan that has been out for review. So uh, please welcome Lisa Hood, our public engagement specialist. Good evening, everybody. So I have a very short presentation for you. Steve and I were here back in the January meeting um, to, to introduce you to this draft public engagement plan. So you've already heard a summary of it, but I'll just quickly go through kind of the process of how we developed it and the process of the public comment period so far. I want to remind you why we are updating the public engagement plan. As most of you would know, um, there is a federal transportation planning requirement that we have a public participation plan. We do have one in place. It's the Public Involvement in Regional Transportation Planning document, but it is a bit out of date as it was adopted in 2010. So it's definitely time for a refresh on that. We also received some recommendations in our most recent federal quadrennial review related to the Unified Planning Work Program um, that made us want to make some changes to that document. And because of that, we really wanted to take that opportunity to extend um, kind of the thought about public engagement in Dr. Cog beyond just transportation planning and really have that reach out to all of Dr. Cog's work functions. So that's what this new document does. And also, most importantly, we wanted this new document to be much more intentional about really getting meaningful public in involvement and not just doing the public engagement that meets the minimum requirements of what we're, what we're supposed to do, but goes beyond that. So the process of updating the plan has taken us a little over a year. We um, started by reviewing best practices from other typical or um, similar organizations, and then we went through an iterative review with lots of different internal stakeholders, all of our different departments within Dr. Cog reviewed this um, many, many times, and we presented that introduced draft in January. Um, this slide says that we anticipate adoption in at the April meeting, which would be the next one. We've decided instead to try to get that adoption onto the May, um, the May Board of Directors meeting, and that's really just to give us more time to take it through uh, the Transportation Advisory Committee and Regional Transportation Committee, and to have more time to put kind of final design touches on the document, because this is really just a bare bones document, and try to make it, especially the, de the design, more public facing and public friendly. Um, so that you'd be seeing the adoption at the May meeting. The public comment period, um, we opened, like I said, we were here in January to introduce the plan before the public comment period opened. It's been posted on our website since January 17th. As part of that federal requirement, there is a 45-day public comment period. I think it was over 60 days that we actually had it up. We had the public hearing notice published in the Denver Post at the end of January. And then we've been promoting the public engagement th plan through our social media, um, the Dr. Cog website, the various newsletters that we put out. And then we also sent out a promotion toolkit to all of the board of directors so that you could share it with your networks. Um, and that included some of the, the images that you see on this slide, as well as a short message about what the plan was about. We also sent it to the Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration just to get some informal feedbacks and some of their recommendations in our previous review were um, part of the impetus of, of updating this plan. And we got some good feedback from the, from, um, the Federal Highway Administration. We've also um, taken it on a road show and done informational presentations at the Transportation Advisory Committee and Regional Transportation Committee um, between January and now. And since I did summarize it at the last 
um, meeting. I don't want to go through that again. Um, but I will just briefly say the general um, things to, to think about with this plan. The intent is really that the plan serves as a guidebook for Dr. Cog's staff. It's written with Dr. Cog's staff as the target audience. And it's to help staff plan and implement effective engagement. And it also secondarily is meant to be a statement of Dr. Cog's commitment to meaningful engagement and really setting us up in the future um, for this new kind of um, commitment to engagement. And then the three main highlights that I talked about at our January meeting as well, we have guiding principles that kind of lay the groundwork for all of public engagement, set um, the tone for it, and then we have these steps for engagement, which I explained in January aren't really linear, but they're more just um, a way to standardize how we do public engagement across all of these different work functions that Dr. Cog does. And then finally, we have this huge portion of the plan that's appendices, um, which is the really important toolkit that Dr. Cog staff will use when planning and implementing and evaluating, which is a really important part of the plan, um, the public engagement that we do. So that's the very quick presentation. Um, and Steve and I can take any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you very much. The hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you have not finished by the end of three minutes, I'll ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you not repeat uh, specific points made by the prior uh, speaker. A simple statement of agreement uh, with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. When you hear your name uh, called, please approach the microphone in the area and be prepared to testify as soon as the procedure is finished. Right now, I think this is the only one we have signed up, right? So, Randall, is it Loeb? Yes. Yes. This is Randall Loeb. Uh, I'm a, just a normal citizen and uh, in Denver. Um, I represent many people who are challenged in many ways, including myself, mental health and age and other, everything else, um, economically and socially. And scanning this, um, I feel that a lot of us are not verbal. We are not uh, directed in this way. And when I was part of the Citizen Academy, my greatest problem with it is that a lot of it doesn't deal with poverty. And I think once you hear me during the public comment, you'll know why that's a, a very significant thing for you to address. Because if we're not really including all the people and have equity, which I really mean that word, then we're missing the, the train. Thank you for your um, opportunity to share with you. Thank you, Mr. Loeb. Anyone else would like to testify from the public? Seeing none, I'll move to, are there any questions to the, from the board? Yes, Director Jones. I was wondering if we could get a staff response to the, the commenter about what we are doing to engage um, folks who are underrepresented, because I think you've done some thinking about that. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Yes. Um, Mr. Loeb makes a really important point, and that was actually um, one of the main goals with this document is to put more focus on how we will be engaging kind of the traditionally underrepresented um, folks in these types of processes. And so you'll see in the appendices there's various tools and techniques that um, we would be trying to implement with the various projects that we'd be working on to reach those types of groups, as well as um, I mentioned that the evaluation is a really important part of this plan. And so we'll be continually evaluating our processes and seeing how they're working or not working and tweaking them in the future to constantly be improving our public engagement um, and how we are reaching the different populations. And another big part of the plan is one of those steps is identifying potential participants. And that's really putting a lot of focus on making sure that we are identifying the people that need to be heard for each project and putting that focus on that. And we'll be developing public engagement strategies for each project and then doing evaluations of each project and then summarizing all of those evaluations each year on a regular basis to make sure that we're really keeping in touch with how we've been doing and how we can do better at reaching those groups. Yeah, and I would just add to that uh, um, with respect to Mr. Loeb you know, and some of the uh, communities that, that he represents. Um, I, I would love the opportunity, Randall, to spend some time with you as we begin developing, let's, let's say, a public engagement plan uh, uh, for our next 
uh, project or initiative here to spend some time with you and, and ask you how we can per perhaps reach some of these um, different audiences. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, this brings tonight's public hearing to a close. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. The board is currently scheduled to make uh, take action excuse me, on the public engagement plan at the May board meeting. Thank you. Moving right along, we're going to the reports uh, of the chair. I do want to recognize somebody tonight for their five-year anniversary, Ms. Baca. Ms. Baca. <laughs> do you mind coming up, up here? Just uh, you were working hard over there. You know, you know, Miss Baca. It's my turn. It's my turn to razz you right now. She razzes razzes me at the uh, sub regional meetings. My turn. I'm recognizing her for five years. Uh, she wasn't here the other day, so we're, we're going to take the opportunity to do a little photo op and congratulate her. We're going to move right along into the uh, RTC we met yesterday. Uh, we discussed uh, tonight, you'll see a little bit, I believe, about 2018-21 uh, tip, right? Yeah. Yep. Um, but we also had a good, healthy do uh, discussion around, uh, well, I'm taking it out of order, mobility choice blueprint. We already saw that, that presentation last time at the uh, workshop. Um, the RTC had a good discussion around Oh, I think all sorts of topics. I mean, anyone can weigh in. I, John, I, were you awake during that meeting? <laughs> um, but you know, any we talked mostly about cybersecurity, so a little bit about that. We talked about governance and data collection and uh, technology, mobility next, uh, a array of different things. It was a good, healthy conversation with with that board. I'm sure there's a lot more to come around our execution and support of the blueprint. We also talked about the 2023 transportation. Uh, improvement program set-asides, and that was it. So moving right along into the Performance Engagement Committee. Uh, what is it? I'm sorry, we moved. Ashley, sorry. We didn't meet. Oh, thank you. Sorry, we changed all the deck chairs, and I couldn't remember who, who was there. And then who threw me was uh, the reports from the Finance Budget Committee is the Vice Chair, Director Shaw. Thank you. Yes, the Finance and Budget Committee met today. We talked about uh, a resolution authorizing uh, the executive director to uh, uh, engage in a maintenance contract for about $109,000 uh, to support website work for the AAA. And if you have not been to the website recently, uh, I understand it's a good place to visit. There's a lot of good information about medical doctors, and that kind of has to do with the amount that was spent. We also uh, elected a vice chair, moi, and uh, went through <laughs> some <laughs> additional items uh, uh, about investment of funds and uh, contracts. Uh, there is a report of the contracts that were signed. That is my report. Thank you. Moving on, we have an announcement for a public hearing for amendments of the Metro Vision Plan and the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So I'm going to read our public hearing. Um, the Denver Regional Council of Governments, Dr. Cog, has scheduled the public hearing for April 17th, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. in the room, in this room, to receive comments on proposed amendments to the Metro Vision Plan and to the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and associated air quality conformity uh, determinations. Um, further information about the public hearing is available on Dr. Cog's website, including the proposed amendments and how to provide comments. Thank you, and now we'll move right along to the Executive Director's report. Thank you, Mr. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. A uh, number of items this evening. First, programmatically, uh, April work session has, is canceled. 
You remember that was part of a motion that was made at the last meeting that uh, we canceled the, the work session, but we're going to have a longer than normal meeting at our regular April 17th meeting when we're going. The subregions will uh, present their recommendations of projects to, to the full board. So, um, and yes, Peeney will also not meet. And made that decision in concert with the new chair. Oh. <laughs> Executive board. Yes. Um, the award celebration uh, is on April 10th. I hope everybody signed up. If not, please do so. Uh, the registration closes on March 29th. We had a great turnout last year, as you all know, and we're hoping to get it one again this year. Sponsorships are going extremely well. We're really happy where we are right now. So thank you all very much if you did purchase tables. Um, but please sign up um, to, to, uh, to attend that event. It's free for board directors. <laughs> And um, it, if you want to bring a guest, it's a discounted rate of $49. So please, we, we really, really want to have a great turnout for that event. It's a celebration. It's the board's annual event, and uh, we hope you can make it. Um, we, we have scheduled a board orientation on Thursday, April 25th, the 4th p.m. In this, in this room, oh no, in Red Rocks upstairs. Um, f for those that are interested, it's particularly good, useful for, for new board members uh, and or alternates. Uh, we also welcome uh, you know, your staff to attend that if you have new staff members that you think will have some interaction with, uh, with our staff here at Dr. Cog. We strongly encourage them to, to, um, to show up as well. It's a great opportunity to learn a little bit more about Dr. Cog. Uh, the Digital Regional Aerial Photography Project, or better known as DRAP, we recently completed the 28 um, version of that, and I just want to thank uh, all of you and, and the, 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 those uh, communities that participated in that. Um, it takes significant time and, uh, and resource commitments from all of us in order, order to pull this off. And it's, uh, um, you know, acquiring high resolution imagery for the entire region is no easy feat. And um, so we thank you again for your participation in that. As a result, all of us that, that partic participated in that were able to get some um, imagery at a fraction of the cost that if you were to go out on your own. So thank you all very much. And we're beginning the planning process for the 2020 um, project, so please uh, stay tuned for, for that effort. Who knows what April 1st is? Oh, it's National Census Day. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> same thing. Say, say, yeah, same thing. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to still wrap my head around why they chose that date out of all dates. but. Um, um, so we're holding a webinar to ensure our members have access and, and better understanding to the strategies to make local counts as accurate as possible. It's uh, part of our idea exchange. So um, we'll be, we're holding that on April 8th. And so hopefully, um, if you haven't received notice, you will be receiving notice rather uh, pretty soon on that. There's a lot of changes since the 2010 census, uh, decennial census. So, so please uh, encourage your staff and yourselves to, uh, to attend that event. Um, we've renewed our Grant Finder subscription for another year. I, those present that have used the Grant Finder, I know there are a few out there. Yeah, so we have, we, we purchased 50 seats on that, so we reserve five for ourselves, but all the others are open for you all. Um, so we would strongly encourage you to use it. I think those that have used it would, would, um, would suggest that it's a very, very useful tool. So please, um, you know, if, if you have any questions, please reach out to myself or Flo Rotano or anybody on our staff and we'll help you uh, get set up. Citizens Academy, I just wanted to let you know that our latest, our, um, I guess our Spring Academy, we've received 62 applications and that's far more than what we received last time. It's, um, we're really excited about that and we thank all of you who helped in getting the word out to, uh, to citizens around this region. Um, it's a really, truly is a great opportunity for people to learn about the key regional issues and become more civically engaged. So, um, so, so thank you all very much. We're, we're, uh, we're excited about starting that. And it starts April 4th in this room. So we've sent notices out to, uh, to those that we've accepted into the, into the program for the upcoming year. Um, I mentioned last month that Dr. Cog is continuing our relationship with Urban Land Institute to cover some of the expenses for the uh, technical advisory program that they have. Um, so we typically fund two of those. Uh, the deadline for current applications is, is this Friday, March 22nd. Um, they're not 
particularly arduous uh, to, to fill out. So please, there's still time to submit those, those applications if, you've, if uh, you're so interested. Just last but not least, I have a couple quick hitters here. Um, first, I, since our last board meeting, I had the opportunity to present uh, a, a few of our communities um, at the town of Erie uh, back in April. Thank you, sir, very much. Appreciate that. Uh, Gilpin County earlier this, uh, this month and last night in, in Central City up in Gilpin County. And um, I was giving my presentation, doing the whole spiel at the end, asked for questions, and this one of the aldermen asked a question, and he wanted to know about, um, you know, he had, he had knowledge of our, um, the Mile High Compact. He talked about that, and then MetroVision 2020 wanted to know if we've done any analysis to determine, you know, if, if we've kind of hit any of those targets and all that. He talked about the T-Rex project. I was like, good Lord, this is pretty impressive. I even said to him, I was like, sir, before I even answer, I got I have much respect for, for just the history of some of those projects within the region. And he had this wry grin on his face, right? And so I answered the question, whatever I said. And then afterwards, I was walking out with a staff member, and uh, I said, you, what's the story on the, you know, the alderman you know, on the far end? And he said, um, I'm looking at Wynn because she probably knows what I'm going to say. Um, it's, his name is Jack Heidel. I don't know if anybody knows Jack, but he's the former city manager in Lone Tree. He was the first city manager. He served for 18 years. And uh, so that's quite interesting. I guess in his, during his tenure in Lone Tree, he lived up in Central City for a good portion of that, which is quite a commute, if nothing else. Um, <laughs> but that was quite interesting. I, I, now that I, I know why he had that kind of smile on his face. Anyway, I, also, I would like um, to congratulate on behalf of all of us, Elise Jones for receiving her confirmation as a new member of the State uh, Air Quality Control Commission. Elise, congratulations on that. And also, um, according to the 2019 County Health Rankings Report by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Douglas County claimed the top spot in Colorado for for, uh, I guess, healthiest county. I, I, I'm taking full credit, by the way. My, my bike commute here daily, I think, uh, I think that, that's, that swayed the vote. But we also had, we had five other community, uh, five other counties in, uh, in the top 10. Boulder was number four, Broomfield five, uh, Jefferson County eight, Gilpin nine, and Arapaho was 10. So that's pretty impressive amongst the 64 counties. So that's great, great. Last but not least, I want to reintroduce, with him present this time, our new HR director. Last month, you recall, I, uh, I introduced Randy without him being here because, quite frankly, I forgot to tell him that we had a meeting. Um, he started back, uh, it seems like he's been here forever, from my perspective. I'm glad he's here, cause, and I know staff is, because I know they were, they were not impressed with me as the HR director for two months. <laughs> So Randy, Arnold, thank you, sir, very much. We really do appreciate it, and we look forward to a long and lasting relationship. Yep. And that's my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Doug. Next up is item number eight, public comment. Uh, up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete the public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will be uh, begin after the last speaker. Yes, Mr. Loeb. Uh, I'm Randall Loeb. I live at 1400 Lafayette Street, although my permanent address is 1480 Logan Street, but we closed that building down on March 31st. What we need to do is find a way, as I said before, to live with equity. That's a word that most people do not understand. It means that we have a creative and inclusive problem-solving strategy with no exceptions and everyone included. At 1480 Logan Street, there is a public bathroom outside. Nicholas Williams and I have talked many times about it. It is a disgrace, in my estimation, to have the kind of filth and squalor and quality of life that is there that pours rampantly into the building. Two days before my birthday, which was January 29th when I was 68, I was assaulted by a drug dealer who operated out of a room in that building. 
the person was allowed to stay there. The police, the sheriff, and everybody else didn't do anything. I went to testify in court on the day that he was appointed to appear. I appeared before the judge, and I asked for restorative justice, which is another word that many people do not understand. What we have to do in our society, if we are going to create the opportunities we need for everyone, is to make sure that a billion dollars, and I'm not being facetious in using that word, be allocated on an ongoing basis until we have created the affordable housing for all populations necessary in our state. The drug dealing place that I represent downtown, Logan and Colfax, is the highest drug use place in the state of Colorado. I've made the point to the Crime Prevention Control Commission that it is usually minority people who are most affected that, in that place. And some people take umbrage at me for making that comment. But I come from North Philly. I know what it means to have racism and racial injustice. And that's why I use that word equity. We need equity for women. We need it for men. And when I'm finished with this, I hope you'll understand that on March 31st, I become homeless. And I know, see, 30 seconds left, but that's not necessary. I think the point is made. I'm a very educated and skilled person in most respects, and yet I have nowhere to live. Thank you, Mr. Loeb. Anyone else? Seeing none, we'll move on to uh, item number nine, Community Spotlight. Tonight we're going to speak or hear from, excuse me, Adams County and Arapahoe County. So who's up first? Adams? I, I believe we are. It, my name is Steve Odoricio from Adams County. I'm normally the ultimate. And we're going to play a video for you. Pretty soon. In one of the fastest growing counties in America. We are doing it now. Thank you so much. Employees in Adams County are keeping pace through our commitment to innovation, integrity, and excellence in service delivery to our residents. For the first time, people in the Berkeley neighborhood are enjoying safe passage to school and on strolls thanks to our sidewalk program. Public Works is also improving safety and quality of life for residents in rural areas with their innovative approach to gravel roads. These surfaces are so smooth and durable, a three-year-old can ride a tricycle on them. Someday that little guy will register a slightly larger vehicle and he'll likely use the new kiosks and queuing system in our motor vehicle offices that have reduced wait times by more than 50%. And while wait times are down, adoptions at our animal shelter are way up. The new website is helping reunite families with lost pets and construction is already underway on the new Riverdale Animal Shelter. This modern new shelter will anchor the southern expansion of Riverdale Regional Park. Partners like Denver Botanic Gardens and the Colorado Railroad Museum will make this a unique attraction when this portion of the park opens in 2020. There is a lot of construction planned and underway across the county, and our new e-permit center is helping developers streamline the process. In 2018, the county processed more than 6,500 building permits, setting a new record for the fourth consecutive year. In 2019, the county will have to pull a few permits of our own. Our fleet and public works building in Commerce City is expanding, just like our population. Another project designated for design in 2019 will transform the county's former Child and Family Services building into affordable housing. Working with Unison Housing Partners, the first wave of this new building will provide transition housing for children who age out of the foster care system. And that foster care system is already benefiting from the Homes for Hope project. The county renovated these two homes to accommodate emergency foster care placement. These homes opened late in 2018 and will help reduce stress for children going through traumatic circumstances. The county's efforts to improve the lives of young people facing multiple challenges to education includes our fourth year of the Adams County Scholarship Fund. 
More than 200 high-performing students on the free and reduced lunch program have already received four-year scholarships using tax money from the sale of retail marijuana. And this year, three of them will graduate early, completing a bachelor's degree in only three years. Someday those students may be working on the latest aerospace technology at Colorado Air and Spaceport. In 2018, the county was awarded only the 11th Spaceport Operator's License in America. Look for the pace of innovation to accelerate at this new facility that will keep 21st century jobs and 21st century dreams here in Adams County and Aerospace Alley. Our staff in the treasurer's office did a lot more than process property tax payments. Their annual free tax preparation program helped hundreds of low-income residents file a proper return. Our assessor's office restructured the senior and veteran exemption process for accuracy and efficiency. And both the treasurer and assessor opened a satellite office at the Pete Morales Human Services Center in Westminster to improve access to their offices. The hardworking men and women in our sheriff's office protected our residents while coping with a tragic loss. Deputy Heath Gum was killed in the line of duty and our community came together to help support the sheriff's office as they mourned their loss. Later in the year, the Sheriff's Office introduced an opioid addiction treatment program for inmates at the detention facility. Adams County is one of two in the state that extend this program to continue after the inmate leaves our facility with no financial burden on the taxpayer or the inmate. And coming in 2019, residents experiencing poverty or homelessness will have the opportunity to work with attorneys as we partner with cities throughout the county to provide assistance through Colorado Legal Services. That just scratches the surface on ways our dedicated staff members and elected offices are transparently providing services with integrity and innovation. Public service is a public trust and we're working harder than ever to keep Adams County moving forward. All right, thank you. I wish I could say I did that video, but I didn't. So are there, at this time, are there any questions? Yes. One. Okay. Um, so it looks like you're doing some infrastructure and capital expansion. Um, what's the uh, source of funds for that? So right now, Adams County has a 0.5% sales tax that goes through 2026, I believe. So we're going to have to renew it soon. Uh, a so that's 0 0.5. Three um, and two, what we did is we combined uh, a transportation sales tax as well as a facility sales tax. So we kind of, those are the five together. And those are, um, that really helps us out a lot. It also helps that we are debruced, uh, which means that we don't have to give back. I hear, see a lot of people like, oh, the, you know, but that's really a big deal is that during those times where things are going well, we could catch up from those times when things were not going so well. So I think that, um, Adams County, because of our growth also, we are experiencing some very positive um, financial uh, situations that allow us to invest, whereas some of our friends may not be able to because they have to give all that money back. Any other questions for Adams County? Got off the hook kind of easy by just throwing a up, but. Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank well, you thank, very much. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Rodricio. Next up, we have Arapahoe County. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm B Bill, Commissioner Bill Holden. I'm into my uh, second term and uh, two years. Um, I have a, a brief video to show you, and then, and unlike Adams, we'll we'll go into more depth. <laughs> <laughs>
Please enjoy the video. Arapahoe County is a great place to live, to work, and to raise a family. From our urban landscape in the west to rural agricultural roots in the east, we offer something for everyone. Great communities, excellent schools, safe neighborhoods, scenic parks, trail and transportation networks that can take you miles. Our county is home to some of the largest employers, one of the nation's busiest regional airports, our world champion Denver Broncos, shopping centers and cultural amenities that make life enjoyable for nearly 700,000 residents who proudly call Arapahoe County home. We strive to foster a safe and vibrant community for residents, businesses, and employees who live happy and healthy lives. During good times and bad, you can rely on Colorado's first county to deliver programs and services that improve your quality of life. Whether we are providing assistance to veterans, seniors, and vulnerable populations, or services through our assessor, clerk and recorder, our coroner, the sheriff's office, treasurer, or commissioners, we do so with an emphasis to ensure you enjoy a great life in Arapahoe County. Quality of life, our mission, our values, our commitment to you. Thank you very much. Uh, what you see up uh, uh, displayed right now is a kind of a, a, a general example of some of the factors that that uh, play into our our county and why we're why we're so proud of it. Arapahoe County is one of Colorado's fastest growing counties. Today, the population is nearly 650,000. By 2030, it is expected to re reach 800,000. The county is home to 13 cities and towns and nine school districts. Appro approximately 22,200 employees are located within the county, representing uh, more than, uh, employers, representing more than 373 employees. The medium household income is 69,553, and the average age of our residents is 36. Uh, as an elected board of five county commissioners oversee uh, implementation of over a 404 million dollar budget and with more than 220 employees. The, the county provides 240 program services ranging from maintaining infrastructure, issuing driver's license to protecting, uh, ch protecting ch child uh, welfare and ensuring care and custody of inmates. Like, other, uh, like others in the rooms, Arapahoe County is focused on, ba on a balancing population growth and with delivering a man mandate state and federal programs to meet the residents' expectations. Next slide, please. What you see here is a slide that talks about kind of our strategic uh, framework and, uh, and performance management program. As you can see, the top of the pyramid shows uh, uh, quality of life, which is our primary focus and, and, its, and its foundation is based upon financial responsibility, uh, performance uh, uh, based um, performance based culture and uh, service first. Uh, we use Arapo, <coughs> we use um, Align Arapo, a performance management framework to serve as the as a transparent and um, uh, performance uh, management tool uh, to, uh, un to help our, our people uh, and citizens understand our governance and report uh, its achievements on a regular basis. The three goals have remained constant, financial responsibility, quality of life, and service first. The county ev uh, counties ev evaluates programs and service through the lens of a fina uh, financial responsibility to deliver foundational elements of service first and quality of life. Each department has a scoreboard and, and the elected and appointed leadership meets on a quarterly basis to review the framework and the process 
made within the county overall scorecard. So we, 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 we put these surveys on our website so citizens can see, see how our various services are performing according to the matrix that we have developed. Next slide, please. On our website, we provide a public-facing da da dashboard by which any citizen can go online and look at the various uh, activities amongst those three, three issues that we discuss, service first, financial responsibility, and quality of life. Uh, you, can, you can get to this website by going to arapo.clearpointstrategy.com. So at any time, you can look at and see any of those elements uh, at the lower level uh, as to what's going on in the county and how we're measuring our success or success. Next slide. This scoreboard allows uh, our citizens to simply click on the, the various icons to find out what programs are, are, are going on within the county and, and how we're measured and how we're self-measuring our performance. We're very proud of our, our, our um, our uh, compliance program that we put form that falls under the guise of Arapaho, uh, a line Arapaho performance dashboard, uh, where citizens can actually see on a real time basis how we're performing, where our weaknesses are, and and begin to address and talk to us about how they like to see uh, our various services improved to meet their their new challenges. We're very proud of the uh, the quality of service that we provide in the county. And we're facing the similar problems that Adams County is facing, as I said earlier, in the massive growth that we anticipate in the next 30 years. Um, the, the always uh, eminent problem facing all counties and all municipalities is how to deal with the finance, to finance these expanded requirements and services. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Director Shaw. A single comment that one of the things that I like most about Arapaho County is your historical properties. And so I didn't want us to leave your presentation without a mention of those. Thank you. Well, I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Our 11 mile house and, and our open, space pro, uh, open spaces program is one that we're very proud of. Uh, we share uh, the resources that come in from our, our our sales tax and our open space program with all our communities and they and uh, on a per capita basis and then we also provide uh, large grants in excess of 500,000 for various communities to come in and participate what we like to see is 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 sharing of those costs and collaboration amongst a variety of of uh, cities count cities and and uh, and towns as well as uh, special districts and we spend uh, uh, nearly four million dollars a year on those programs. Any other questions for Arapaho County? All right, thank you very much. Okay, since we're not, oh actually we're going to postpone this uh, community uh, spotlight for April into May. And the next two communities that were uh, randomly selected is Aurora and Bennett. All right, moving right along on item number 10. Uh, move to approve the consent agenda. It's at attachment B in your packet. Looking for a motion. There's one, there's a second. Those, those all in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Abstentions? Thank you very much. That's approved. Moving on to item number 11, uh, discussion. These are action items. Discussion of the appointment of members and alternates to the State Transportation Advisory Committee and E-470 Authority Board. Um, that's attachment C in your packet. And so we'll... Uh -huh. I was just going to do Go a quick it. report on Go it. Um, just so you all know, I, I believe you do, but each year we, uh, 
we uh, we opened it up for a representation from this board to serve on the the state state transportation advisory committee and the E four seventy authority board. So um, our current members on those is our Director Jones and Director Partridge serve as member and alternate on stack, and um, uh, Director Rakowski and Director Roth serve on the E four seventy board as a member and, and alternate. Um, so we reached out to those folks to see if they, there was an interest in, in continuing that. Um, both uh, Jones, Director Jones, and R Director Partridge expressed an interest. Um, Director Roth did express an, an interest uh, in, in continuing. Um, Mayor Rakowski did not. And the reason why is because um, he leaves office in the fall. So, um, so that position is, is definitely open. Thank you. And, and, and we would entertain any additional interests into either one of these boards. Is there any interests from the floor? Yes, Director Roth. Uh, I'm happy to move from the alternate to the member. Thank you. Others? Well, this, OK, OK, gotcha. Gotcha. All right. so. Now I guess we'll look for our motion. Well, we need a we need an alternate still to E four seven. Volunteers, do I get to pick? <laughs> oh, George, I'll go ahead and volunteer as uh, Bob's alternate on E four seventy. If there are no other desired, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. As a member of the E four seventy board, I welcome uh, alternate and our new member. I welcome them. I welcome them to E470 board, is what I meant. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll be needing a motion if there's no other. I'd like to make a motion. Go for it. I'd like to make a motion to appoint Director Jones and Partridge to serve as the member and alternate respectfully to the stack, and um, Directors Roth and George Teal from Castle Rock to serve on E470. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstentions? Okay. Thank you for those that volunteer on those boards. Those are also long days as well. Uh, item number 12, discussion of sol uh, solicitation of interest to serve on the performance and engagement, finance and budget, and regional transportation committees. Uh, Mr. Rex, this is attachment D. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, and all we're doing this evening is uh, opening up and soliciting uh, membership on, on uh, all three of those committees. So. P performance and engagement and finance and budget committees. Um, as you know, they're subcommittees of the board. Um, we would strongly encourage you to participate in one of those. Um, they're fun, no doubt about it. I know it's an extra meeting, but we try to do it in relationship to, to the board meetings and the board work sessions. So it's, it's not like you, know, you necessarily have to make an extra trip down here. So we would, you know, if, if you're so desired, we would love to have you on those committees. And um, we have uh, the current members are listed within the packet. So if you would like to reach out to them just to explore if you have questions about that, of course, I'm always available to do that as well. Um, Connie, let me ask you this. With regards... To, I was just going to say, with regards to the membership that, that are current members, do they have to re-up? Some of them will need to ask for, re ask for reappointments. Some will not. All of those of you who are on those two committees, you telling you whether you need to be reappointed. Great. Very much. So uh, for, for the regional trans... Oh, we have a question over here. Yes. Thank you. I was wondering, how do you consider mem uh, board members or board directors who may be leaving their term during the appointment to a committee? Um, we want you to apply for performance and engagement. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, That's I, a party group. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I, mean, I, I, I think we would like to have, I mean, for the for any time you're willing to dedicate to one of these two subcommittees, we're happy to have it. Yes, Connie. So when you, if you uh, happen to leave your tenure while you're on one of these two committees, whoever takes over your position on the board afterwards would assume that seat. That's a great point. I forgot that. Yeah. And so on the Regional Transportation Committee, just so you all know what that is, it's um, 
It's really, it's, it's very unique to this region, right? I've been, this is my fourth council of governments that I've been part of, a fourth MPO, and it's not, we, most other places don't have this, and it's what it is, it's, it's, it's a membership of Dr. Cog, uh, CDOT, and RTD, as well as, well as some special interests. We have environmental interests on there, we have uh, business interests on there. It's a pretty cool committee, and as you've been here long enough, you know that, um, that in order for transportation-related measures to, to ultimately get approved, we have to have the same um, affirmative vote by both the board and the RTC. So it's a very, very important uh, committee, and it, it just, again, speaks to the level of collaboration that we have amongst our planning partners here in this region. So it's a pretty cool thing. Um, it's at 8.30. Uh, in the morning on uh, on Tuesdays before the board meeting, that's probably the the only drawback. But uh, I think it's uh, it's a worthwhile uh, committee for those that are interested. So we are looking for two additional members to serve on that that committee, as well as up to at least four, a minimum of four alternates, um, because obviously at times we. Uh, um, the members can't make it. So we would en strongly encourage you to give some consideration to that as well. So all we're doing now is um, we're looking for a motion to, to uh, um, open solicitation of interest. Motion, second. 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 All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Mentions, that is passed. So those are now open. So please submit those, those uh, statements of interest to Connie. Thank you. Next up, uh, item number 13, discussion of policy amendments to the 2018-21 Transportation Improvement Program. Uh, Mr. Papstorf, Dr. Nee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members of the board, Ron Papstorf, Transportation Planning and Operations uh, Director here, Dr. Cog filling in for Todd. I'm not Todd Cottrell. Um, for your consideration, this evening are two policy amendments to the 2018-2021 Transportation Improvement Program TIP. Uh, just by way of reminder, um, we, entertain, we entertain proposed TIP amendments from project sponsors on a fairly regular basis as needed. Uh, there are two types of TIP amendments. Uh, we have administrative amendments that are for smaller changes, sort of without a policy implication. Those are typically included as an informational item in each of your monthly agenda packages as they're processed administratively. And then there are policy amendments uh, that are for larger changes to the TIP. Those are changes in excess of $5 million uh, in uh, change to a project or even smaller projects that might have a significant policy implication associated with them. So tonight, uh, for your consideration, are two amendments proposed uh, by uh, CDOT. One, the First Amendment is from Region 4, which is Boulder County and Southwest Weld County, primarily in the Dr. Cog region, to add three specific projects uh, in the surface treatment pool. So in the TIP, there's a pool of money for surface treatment projects. When the region allocates money from that pool to specific projects, in this case, these are fairly large, totaling $13 million uh, for those three, those three specific projects. Those are brought forth as amendments to the TIP. The second amendment uh, from CDOT is related to the I-25 uh, South Gap project uh, from Castle Rock to the El Paso County line. Um, that, pro that amendment being proposed would add $8.9 million of faster safety funding for additional safety improvements in the corridor, including deer fencing, uh, to reduce the amount of wildlife uh, vehicle crashes in that corridor. Uh, the scope is updated to reflect uh, the new total current uh, project costs. This amendment comes with specific money uh, to pay for those improvements in, to the tune of the $8.9 million. Uh, this was presented to the Transportation Advisory Committee on February 25th, though with an um, unanimous uh, recommendation of approval, and then went to the Regional Transportation Committee yesterday, also with a recommendation for approval to the board this evening. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Any questions for Mr. Papsdorf? Hang on, thank you very much. Next up. Uh, we, do, we do have a recommended oh, motion sorry. there, Mr. Chair. 
All right, I'm getting ahead. I'm looking at the time. Uh, trying to beat some records here. Just kidding. Yes, uh, director. Let me get director Jones and then director Teal. Okay, I was just going to make a motion. Okay, director if Teal. If you want to do it. Cool. No sweat. Chairman, move to approve the uh, attached amendments to the 2018 through 2021 Transportation Improvement Program as presented. Thank you. Can we have a second? Aye. Thank you. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? That's passed. Thank you. Now, next up, number 14, discussion on state legislative issues. Uh, so, uh, Mr. Morrow. We're looking at attachment F first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, member, uh, board members, directors. Uh, I wanted to see if we could start for a couple of minutes before we get into the four new bills that we have for you tonight uh, to have your lobbyists give a brief overview of the status of the state budget and also to talk a little bit about uh, an important bill that a lot of you have uh, heard about that just got introduced today, Speaker Becker's debrucing measures. So Ed and Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle, if you guys would take it away. Good evening. Today was day 76. We have 31 working days left in the session. Um, <laughs> last Friday, the legislature received its quarterly revenue estimates. So the governor's office and the Legislative Council economists come together and present an update on the state economy, the national economy, and most importantly, where the state revenues are. And both economic forecasts were slightly down from the December forecast. Um, there's an increased level of uncertainty. And while things, while the economy continues to expand, it's at a slower rate. So for example, uh, the funding for fiscal year, for the current fiscal year, was reduced by $261 million general fund. That's the estimate of what we're going to be down this year over where we were in March. There were similar, um, though less severe, decreases um, uh, estimated by the governor's office. The first one was by legislative council. Um, one of the things those decreases did, however, is they really um, reduced our expected Tabor refund. As was mentioned earlier during the Adams County presentation, um, Tabor caps the revenues that the state can bring in. The state is not debruced. Anything over the limit must be repaid to the taxpayers. In December, for example, for this fiscal year, the legislature anticipated we would have a $380 million Tabor, million dollar Tabor refund this year. That's now down to $64 million. Quite a difference based on that revenue um, decrease from, uh, from last week. So that was last, last week. This week, the legislature finalized its budget recommendations to be introduced in the bill. So the Legislative Joint Budget Committee, the six members that have been working since early November, they had a couple of priorities in working with the governor's office. One, as you all know, is provide free full-day kindergarten. A lot of the rural schools already do this. A lot of the metro, the larger metro schools charge tuition if you want to enroll your child in full-day kindergarten. The governor's priority is to make that free across the state, that uh, the legislature appropriated $185 million as a placeholder for that bill. Um, K-12 education, outside of that, the regular funding for K-12 education at this point is looking, looking at a 4.29% increase. And higher education, which is a smaller section of the state budget, is looking at about a 13% state funding increase with the agreement that none of the state's institutions will raise their resident tuition rates. With the exception of Metro State, that's always in a little bit of a different category. But all the others would be flat for next year on the resident side. Some of the other issues in terms of the financial issues that the state has been discussing, there'll likely be no change to the Gallagher Amendment that would be discussed in this legislative session. There had been a lot of discussion last summer about possibly either changing it through statute or submitting something to the voters. I think those plans are now not going to happen. Um, and as Rich said today, there was the long-awaited pair of bills, companion bills, to submit to the voters a revenue question of should the state uh, be debruced? Should the state, in effect, get rid of its um, revenue caps from Tabor? 
as many local governments, all but four school districts, and lots of other entities throughout the state have already done. It's not a tax increase, it's just a question of allowing the state to keep the revenues that come in at the current tax rates. Um, these bills, House Bill 1257, and I can't remember the other one, they were just introduced tonight. 1258, it's the, 1258. It's the very Two next of one. Them tonight, one is the question, and the other saying if any revenues come in that would have otherwise been refunded, they would be allocated to three areas transportation, and it's specific to roads, bridges, and transit, K 12 education, and higher education. Now, that's not viewed as some sort of a cure all for the state's fiscal challenges. Since Tabor passed, I think we've had nine years of Tabor refunds out of the 25 years. However, a lot of people see this as a necessary first step and, uh, and an ability to provide the state with just a little bit of flexibility. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jennifer who will talk about transportation. Right. Thank you, Ed. So what does this all mean for transportation? Um, as you all know, I think at our last meeting or maybe in January, Rich and I discussed that a lot of legislators held a stakeholder meeting early in the session to talk just in general about transportation. They wanted to put every option on the table, throw anything at the wall, and just to see what sticks as it relates to how are we going to fund transportation with the loss of um, Proposition 109 and 110. Um, that's changed a little bit, especially in light of the budget review that Ed just gave. So now the legislature is going to take certain steps um, for transportation funding. As Ed mentioned, the first step is going to be the debrucing bills, um, which a third of those monies, should we be in a Tabor refund situation, would go for transportation dollars. Um, so that's the first step. The second step is there is going to be a lump sum of dollars given to transportation this year for transportation funding. Don't know what that amount is as of yet. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to see what the legislature governor's office um, can, can agree to. And then thirdly, though it's not been confirmed, but it is highly likely that there's going to be a repeal of the bonding ballot question from Senate Bill 1 last year, so that we will not see that on the ballot this coming year. Um, so that is what is expected in 2019 session. For next session, pending that the debrucing bill does pass at the ballot this coming November, legislators are going to start looking at fees. Um, since we won't have to issue Tabor refunds, um, um, imposing fees will become a lot more flexible. The most obvious one and the first one that I believe they want to try is going to be an increase in a gasoline fee. Then they could go for uh, electric vehicles, autonomous vehicles, and maybe even an increase in the faster fees. Um, so that is the approach that we have right now that we are expecting, no sil silver bullet. And of course, a lot of things have to fall into place in order for this to happen. So nothing substantial, at least that we know of so far, that's going to come for the 2019 session on transportation funding. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, Director Shaw. Thank you. I had one question. I heard from our Douglas County Assessor earlier today that there was going to be a bill that would repeal the senior a property tax exemption and make it a means-tested um, arrangement on taxes or something. And I wonder if you could clarify. You want me to talk about it? Sure. Okay. Uh, so I'll take a crack at that, and Ed and Jen can fill in. So um, it does look like there will be an, a bill introduced this year. Not to, well, not to get rid of it as such, but to replace it. Uh, representatives... Kennedy and Weissman actually have been looking at this issue for a number of years, as have other legislators in past years, uh, because the uh, senior property tax exemption cost to the state has been growing fairly consistently, six to eight, ten million dollars a year, uh, because more seniors are qualifying to, to apply for the exemption. And um, there's a lot of concern that it's it, it will become unsustainable as it just keeps growing more and more cost to the state. So what, and Kennedy and Weissman have uh, also uh, enlisted uh, Senator Lowe's court as a Senate sponsor for the bill, and they, and they have said they're, they're going to go ahead and introduce it. What it would do is use the constitutional provision uh, that allows the legislature to zero out the senior property tax exemption. That exemption is created as such as a 
50% of the first $200,000 of the, your property value. So it allows them to take that 50% to zero. So in this case, what they're proposing to do is it through, through the legislation is to put that, set that at zero and basically leave it at zero for the next 10 years. And in the meantime, include in statute a senior tax credit, senior housing tax credit that would actually be based though on, uh, it, be an income based credit. The, I don't think they've decided on exactly what the income level is because they're tr trying to balance targeting lower middle income seniors, but still make sure that the tax credit doesn't cost more than the existing exemption. So um, at one point, I think they were talking about $100,000 annual income. And of course, it's only for people age 65 and over. Um, I'm guessing the last time I, I heard, they're probably going to lower that because it was making the, the bill too expensive. Um, and they would cap uh, the annual uh, value of the credit at somewhere between $750 and $850 a year. I, I believe, and, and I don't know if you guys know, uh, I believe the value, uh, the average annual uh, exemption or value that people get from the exemption is the from the, like the $500, $600 range. So this could actually be a, a little bit higher. And that's basically the bill. And one of the things that they, they tout as addressing uh, one of the complaints about the senior property tax exemption is that that exemption is not portable because you have to be 65, live good in your home for 10 years. Uh, but if you were to move or downsize, you would lose the exemption. You'd have to start all over again. And this would take care of that. All right, any other questions? So you may see that bill on the next month's <laughs> agenda. Uh, so if there aren't any other questions at the moment, we can go through the four new bills on your list, and then we have a transportation issue uh, to, to bring up before we conclude. So, um, I believe uh, attachment F is actually just an updated status of the bills that you've taken position on in previous months. Um, a couple of them have already died. Um, I think all the housing bills... Uh, are still moving through the process. So unless there's some specific questions about any of those bills, uh, we could move to attachment G for the new bills. I don't see any, so um, if you like, let's start with um, first bill is uh, House or Senate Bill 172. And I, I previewed a, a few of these bills last month because they had we, we knew they were in the works, but they just hadn't been introduced yet. Um, but we knew they were coming. So this bill is a bill that that I've been working on with the Colorado Senior Lobby and uh, Senator Danielson and Janal and Representative Singer, dealing with uh, the um, at-risk adult statute that that Colorado has and some issues that. Uh, di district attorneys have raised about some cases where there's been uh, uh, confinement issues or abandonment issues of seniors uh, and because of some vagueness in the current statutes they haven't been able to prosecute those cases so they they we've been working with them on this bill that tries to tighten up definitions of uh, what would constitute unlawful abandonment of an at-risk adult and what would constitute um, unlawful confinement of an at-risk person. And um, that bill is uh, probably going to uh, be uh, um, calendared for committee in a couple weeks. We're also working with some, on some amendments to help uh, address some questions that some other folks have had. So should we go ahead and um, just take a votes one at a time? So if there, are there any questions about that or otherwise, uh, I, obviously I recommend that we would support that bill. Are there any questions on this particular bill? If not, look for a motion for a recommended position of support for Senate Bill 19-172. Move approval of a support position. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? 
abstentions. Abstention. That passes in support. Next. Uh, the next bill is uh, Senate Bill 173. Uh, again, I think I talked about this a little bit last week or last month. Uh, Colorado Secure Savings Plan Board. Uh, this is, I think, the fifth year that uh, this or a similar bill has been brought to the legislature to create an option uh, for uh, retirement savings for those who work at employers that, for whatever reason, maybe too small or whatever, don't don't offer uh, a retirement plan. This would set up uh, between the state and a contractor uh, a retirement savings plan uh, that, or at least it would lead to the setting up of a retirement savings plan that employees could opt into. And uh, the employers would simply have to uh, create a line in their paycheck every pay period to withdraw a certain amount to, that would then go into uh, their savings plan. What this bill simply does is, is create a, a really a study committee to go through various aspects and issues related to setting up these kinds of plans. And, and there are uh, half a dozen states uh, that have um, passed bills to create these kinds of uh, uh, savings plans. This bill would just simply set up the study committee to see what might work for Colorado, and then that group is uh, charged with making recommendations to the legislature for legislation next year to actually create the bill. So um, on the principle that um, we feel it's, it's good to provide tools for uh, our residents to help develop a, a, what you would call a secure savings when they retired. They're less likely to have to uh, access government services, go on Medicaid, things like that. Uh, that providing this type of tool for people to save uh, would, would be a very good thing. So with that, we would recommend a support position. Yes, uh, Director Elrod. Can you give some perspective of why, why we're wanting to study this um, to be a tool provided by the state as opposed to the private sector already solves for this or creates this opportunity out there? Yeah, I think the I think the really the assumption or the the what the proponents are saying is that there really aren't adequate private sector options for people. You, so you're working at uh, you know, your employer doesn't offer a retirement savings account or, or pro pro program. Um, you could say, well, you can always go to the bank or you can go get a, your own 401k or something. But there's been study after study after study around the nation that prove or show that people just simply are like 15 times more likely to save if it's automatically taken out of their check. If you if you leave it up to somebody to take it upon themselves to set up their own savings account, some people might do it, a lot of people won't. And whether or not um, they should be punished for not taking that responsibility maybe is another question, but looking at the, that kind of information that people would be more stable in their retirements if, if they are in a situation where it's automatically taken out of their check, it really would have benefits for the, st for the state and the state government going forward. So that's kind of the argument for that. Real quick, I just wanted to emphasize that. I think we really took the perspective from the senior services side, and, and Rich alluded to it there at the end, after retirement. You know, it, it puts more of a strain on services that we provide for those that are, you know, don't have the resources to provide after retirement. So that's the perspective we took on this. I, I, and again, I would like to re-emphasize um, about, you know, we, the staff position is just related to the establishment of the task force and not necessarily the merits of the, of the actual content of the study. Information is good. Director Walton. Thank you, Chair. I was wondering if the study would also take up looking at preventative measures to be sure businesses didn't discontinue something that perhaps is benefiting, like a match of some sort, um, that would then end up being a detriment. Um, 
in the reverse. I, I believe that is an element that would be studied, yes. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, looking for a motion in support of Senate Bill 1973, or excuse me, 19173. Move approval of a support position. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. aye. Those opposed? Uh, we need hands on nose. <laughs> Extensions. We have that still passes in, in support of. Next, Rich. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next one is uh, Senate Bill 180, Eviction Legal Defense Fund, is another bill in a uh, uh, series of bills we've seen this year that you've already taken uh, positions supporting on, I think four or five of them now already, um, that would provide. Uh, some assistance to renters, mostly low-income uh, renters, um, to basically on various different issues that can can threaten their ability to remain in their um, most often low-income housing. And again, so coming from uh, largely the aging perspective, but I think it also fits under our, some of our Metro Vision principles uh, for uh, access to affordable housing. Um, this bill uh, basically is built on the, uh, pra or the, the uh, experience in practice that uh, when there are eviction proceedings, uh, particularly when they do go to court, that uh, like 90% of the time the, the landlord is represented by an attorney, like 10% of the time the tenants might be represented by an attorney and this would just uh, provide some state funds that would then be contracted with local nonprofit service providers uh, maybe as an example like the Colorado Legal Services that was mentioned in the presentation earlier uh, to provide uh, representation for tenants in eviction cases and uh, so again based on affordable housing uh, uh, and uh, for seniors and others, principal staff would appreciate a position of support. Any questions? Yes, uh, Director Brockett. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I see it's creating a fund, um, but I saw that under the fiscal note there was an NA. So, so it's um, the there was no fiscal note available uh, on you know online or whatever that we could find that was out there. Uh, when this packet was put together, it may be available now, uh, but the, there is an appropriation in the bill, I believe, for seven hundred fifty thousand dollars. And I would say that, and Ed, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the way the process is going to work, that this bill, um, once it's heard, if it passes out of committee, it would, I believe, it would have to go to appropriations committee, and be considered with all the bills that are in appropriations that are going to have to fight for some of the money that's that's left uh, after the long bill. So that's, but it's 750000 is what they're proposing to appropriate. The general fund. Yes. Dollars. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. I was just going to, it's actually a cash fund. I just. Oh, it is? Yeah, it is a cash fund. Okay. Um, does it, but it just appropriates the money, right? The appropriation, excuse me, Adam, yeah. is the general fund to the cash fund. Oh, okay. And then it's out of the cash yeah. fund. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's Director Shaw. Is there any kind of provision for um, someone who's being evicted for cause, meaning they've destroyed the property or they're brewing right. drugs of some kind, destroying the... The existing laws would be unchanged on that. Uh, if they're being evicted for cause then I don't, I don't believe this would have any, any impact on that. It's similar with a lot of the other bills. Now, it might, uh, I mean, it might provide an opportunity for uh, someone to uh, request legal representation, uh, but it certainly would not um, uh, counter the landlord's le you know, the legal cause that they might have. But it might pay for a lawyer for someone who's creating meth in, in a property 
and not provide the legal well, keep in mind that landlord. this is seven hundred fifty thousand dollars and, <laughs> and I, I think the some... I, I mean you, we're all speculating but I think the uh, the the nonprofits the, you know the legal services providers would have to prioritize is this really someone we can afford to spend the little money we have on representing them Thank you. Yeah. Uh, direct director Odoricio. so actually you saw tonight in our presentation that one of the things that we've done is uh, really invest in a similar type of legal aid clinic and we found that actually um, it actually helps even the landlords too because it allows uh, having lawyers on both sides actually helps speed up and um, lower the temperature of some of these uh, proceedings and so it's kind of I mean not kind of it's a really a win-win for most folks and and the person who's doing that stuff it, it's not designed to try to keep those people in that location or be void of accountability. Mr. X. Thanks, sir, very much. Um, Rich, Ed, Jen, so it, within, the, within the notes here, it says the bill lists permissible uses of grant monies awarded uh, from the fund. Um, I'm hoping that uh, cooking meth is not one of them. No, the, the, the fund is only f to pay the lawyers for representing the, the tenants. Right. That's Director Elrod. <laughs> <laughs> so to get clarification of what um, Diorcio, Odor Director Odoricio. 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 I should know how to say that. I'm Italian. <laughs> um, he he commented that it's both for the um, landlord and the tenant, but you just specify that it's for the. Well, tenant I think only. I think what we're getting at is that typically landlords will, will are much more likely to have their own representation, and tenants typically are unlikely to have their own representation. I, ju I just want to clarify that this is written in a way that it can be applied to either. It's no, it's limited. only. I think I believe it's only for the tenants. Director Odo. Okay, so what I was getting at was that a lot of times um, having a tenant have an attorney also helps with the process is what I'm saying because most landlords do have the access to the resources and to attorneys. But by allowing someone else to have that access to the attorneys quite often can work out situations a lot easier than a landlord's attorney trying to work directly with the tenant who's getting kicked out. You, 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 like I said, I said you turn down the temperature. What you do is you you allow the two attorneys to work it out, and quite often um, you find that some of the evictions actually happen where people aren't kicking holes on their way out because they're getting two or three extra days, and, and they can make it work out a lot better. And uh, one of our county commissioners, Mary Hodge, uh, has a lot of 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 properties, and she has found that um, depending on if the if that individual has a, a lawyer. Uh, the other side, meaning the tenant, that even she has sometimes been able to spend less on her lawyer because they're able to work through the situation a lot faster. But it is it is for the tenants. I am a lawyer. <laughs> I'm also a landlord, so I I'm also a landlord. So thank you. Any other comments or questions? Yes. So the, the way that I'm reading it and the way that I understand it is that it's for those nonprofit type organizations like the Southwest um, Housing Authority that helps folks that are in the process of an eviction. That would be eligible to receive the yeah, money legal, to pay for, yeah. yeah, legal counsel. There's not, uh, so like at the Southwest uh, um, Housing Authority, there's not a lawyer there. Well, they counseling, they get the yeah. legal advice, okay. et cetera, whatever, in order to help them through the process. Is that it? That's the way I read it. It doesn't give a drug dealer. Yeah, I don't have the co a copy of the bill in front of me, but I think there is a definition in the bill of the, the types of organizations that would be uh, eligible. And the way I've thought of it is uh, that it's authority. characterized or nonprofits like uh, the one example people always use is Colorado Legal Services because they provide services to indigent people all over the state. In fact, I think they're one of uh, our AAA's contractors. 
uh, for, for our seniors, that type of organization, and they do have attorneys, and that type of organization would be paid for providing the representation. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? Yes, Director Brockett. I was just going to make a motion. Oh, go for it. Uh, I'll move that uh, we support Senate Bill 180. Okay, did you have a question, Director Wheelock? Okay. <laughs> All right, we have a motion on uh, Yeah, motion and support. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Uh, hands, please. Or those uh, abstentions. That passes. Okay, final bill. Um, last one on the list is uh, another one that I think we talked about a little bit before, uh, House Bill 1239, uh, the Census Outreach Grant Program that uh, is being proposed to um, set up an set up a, a outreach program that would be implemented around the state to help outreach and education and uh, assistance to hard to, what they call hard to count communities, uh, low income, disability, homeless, uh, rural, isolated, uh, and we actually uh, got references to older adults and aging added to the bill. The first draft of the bill didn't reference aging, so but the bill as introduced does. Um, I know that uh, again we've had uh, uh, some contact with some of the census folks and. Um, the uh, other group that I think's called Everybody Counts um, about helping to reach out to local governments and so forth uh, to help get a most complete census count in 2020. Uh, again, the major argument has, has always been that if you don't get a complete count for your state, you're leaving a lot of federal money on the table and possibly foregoing an additional eighth congressional seat, which I'm sure a lot of people in this room might want to run for. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> we need, it'll be interesting to see who runs for that eighth seat. Uh, but apparently we're, we're very close to, uh, to being qualified for one. Um, and it's so many programs uh, from the federal government are based on your population. And one good example, Jayla can probably explain it better than me, but I'll try for our aging program under the Older Americans Act, the basic formula is uh, each state is allocated the Federal Older Americans Act funds essentially based on uh, their state's proportion of the over 60 population. So if we don't get a, a, a good count of our over 60 population, we could lose out on a lot of Older Americans Act funding. That's one concrete example here. Uh, so what this bill does then is set up uh, also a grant program to reach to get the money that would be appropriated. And again, it's asking for a general fund appropriation, so we don't know exactly how that's going to play out in this budget picture. But they're asking for money to do outreach around the state to get money to local governments. Actually, COGS are even listed as eligible entities. Um, to local governments around the state, to, to local nonprofits, community organizations, et cetera, to try to get as much outreach to these hard to count communities around the state. Does that cover it, guys? <laughs> Any questions or comments? Yes, Director Maurer. I'm curious here when it talks about um, expend gifts, grants, or donations. So, what does that mean by expend gifts? Yeah. Well, so it's, it's a common provision in a lot of legislation. Basically, if you're setting up, say, an organization or a program or something, an entity, in this case, this program, just an authority that you're, you're going to be, uh, and maybe if, maybe if it's, I, is this being run out of a state department? I can't remember if it's run out of DOLA. DOLA. Yeah. Yes. So they would give DOLA the uh, spending authority to accept, like, if an, if a, uh, somebody wanted to give money to help with this, so if, a, if a foundation or something. So any kind of gifts, grants, or donations, it allows them to accept them and, and then use the money for the program. Any other questions or comments? 
Uh, yeah. Sorry, we don't take any comments from. So you're not required to answer that question, but you can if you want. I think they were asking the lobbyists. I didn't Do you understand it. the question? The question was who's being held accountable if there are gifts granted or donations given to the department. That's easy. Uh, they would go into the state accounting system, and so anybody could see how the department has spent the money. So that's one advantage of putting gifts, grants, and donations into the appropriation. It would be public. Okay. Any other questions or comments from the board? Chairman? Yes. Before, uh, well, some years ago, my wife and I were full-time RVers, and we never found a way to be counted. We thought about it, we talked about it, looked for it, but we were not counted. So uh, fortunately, I was under 60 at the time, so it didn't matter, I guess. But anyway, that's one of the areas. <laughs> That, it, it, not the under 60, but one of the hidden areas is people in RV campgrounds and, and are moving, and they may only be there for one night. Uh, we, we would stay for two months, yeah. once a year, and then we would be for one or two nights all the rest of the year. So, I think a that's a great example of the kind of outreach that they were, really want to try to to do this time around. Thank you. We will be counted this time. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions or comments? All righty. I look for a motion in support of House Bill 19-1239. Move to support. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed? Abstentions. Three. That passes. Okay, so uh, Doug's going to lead off this discussion about the tra transportation financing issue that the board has talked about the last couple of months. Actually, I, I have a oh. before we move off. Ah, here we go. <laughs> but you know I've already talked to you about it, and I, I want to talk in front of the board about sure. it, is Senate Bill 19-144, which is oh. the uh, motorcycle running the red lights. Yes. So could you share any insight on that one? Um, it's... Do you, do you have the update on it? I think it is passing with an amendment that I, I that CML anyway has said there will will allow them to be neutral on the bill. And because I think cause I'm trying to remember this conversation with Morgan Cullen, their lobbyist, saying that also he's he's been taking a lot of direction from law enforcement, and law enforcement have told him they can live with the amendment. It it sort of codifies existing statute, something to that right. effect. Right, that is correct. So the bill was heard in committee yesterday, Senate Transportation Committee, and I believe it was the motorcyclists, CML, and law enforcement that came together on an amendment that essentially would say that if a stoplight is inoperable or it does not recognize a motorcyclist, that that motorcyclist can then still proceed through until it becomes operable. After waiting. That After wait, but that but that didn't really amend from what they were doing in the first place. So what was the it, amendment? It apparently was a was enough to get CML, as Rich mentioned, to neutral, co basically codifying what is already currently law. Technically, a motorcyclist or any motorist can go through a red light after a certain period. But we're just of time putting in the law books to say it's okay now to run the light. I'm sorry. We're just putting in the law books that it's okay now to run the light. So and that, our that city, bill did our, pass unanimously. Oh. I know I have staff here, so I don't know if they know, but our city opposes that this because we believe that it does impede traffic and congestion because now when you go through a protected green light, you don't know. The motorcycle we already have a hard time seeing is now going to jump out in front of you, and we did not expect it to happen as a protected green light. That's just one scenario, but I, I, hey, hey, Mr. Knight. We, are we still opposing it, or you don't know? I think we're still opposing it. Both our our chief and our city is opposing that. So As amended? Uh, that's what I was hoping yeah. you would know. I, I don't hear a difference in the amendment. Um, it sounds like the same thing. So I, we just we just struggle because our law enforcement says, look, the motorcycles will turn right, make an illegal U-turn. They'll figure ways out. We don't need to put it on a law book to encourage the behavior. 
Um, you know, and so then now you're putting a uh, motorcyclist to be a now traffic engineer to decide that the new technology that does detect them, which is probably 80% of our traffic lights, um, does detect them and they feel like they can still run it. So um, I wanted to bring it to this because I think it impacts uh, incident, traffic incidents, it, it impacts accidents, it impacts our traffic flow, and it creates another hazard that may jump into our already congested uh, roadway system. So if I, I would like to put in, a, I would like Dr. Cogdaway in it because I think it impacts our traffic, but I, I leave it to the board to decide if we mm -hmm. should or shouldn't, but. Yeah, we'll take direction from, from you. Yes, Director Maurer. <laughs> If we do allow that to go forward, or if we support it and it does go forward, the other part of that is is then we're not telling the people that are putting technology out there for traffic signals to make sure that it's better, that it does detect them. Right. So we're kind of giving them the go-ahead instead of saying, no, you got you got to find a way to pick up motorcycles as well. So, so, so you're saying we should support this bill to let them run or should not? Okay. Any other comments? The question is, should we oppose it or just keep an eye on it? <laughs> my, my ask would be to oppose it. Yes. Um, so my council hasn't taken a position on this, so I'll be abstaining, but I just have a question. If CML changed their mind because there's a provision for local control like there is with the safety stop on the bicycles and things like that, or do you know why CML uh, went to neutral on it? Well, I, I asked for copies of the amendment, and I didn't get them, so it must have happened. I don't yeah. know because yeah, what, what, within the last week. Yeah, I just know I had I had asked their lobbyist about it, and he said that with the amendment, uh, the the chief's association when he says law enforcement, I think he means CML's going with what the chief's uh, the association has said that they felt comfortable with that law because it didn't take it any farther than what, or at least in their opinion, any farther than what's already in current law. But we can certainly research that more. Here is is by the time we all get back together, this is surely sure. long gone. Yeah, yeah. And no, I hate to throw something out without further education. So, Director Lisa, Lisa Jones, weigh in. Well, Lisa's thinking about red wine at the current moment. Oh, just, sorry, just never mind. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not seeing a strong enough nexus with Dr. Cog in this bill, and nor do I have, I know my jurisdiction has not looked at it, so I'm not in a position to offer you a motion, and I'm sorry. I'm not necessarily looking for a motion, more of a discussion, because communities, there are other uh, communities that have weighed in, and you might not just know about it. That's been Mr. one Mr. Thing. Chairman, yes, Director. Uh, I have a meeting on Thursday with Hell's Angels, and we'll discuss it. Oh, perfect. <laughs> so, so we'll pass it through intimidation. Yes, Director. There you go. Yeah, just to make this comment, uh, we have addressed this, and our council is supportive of this. So I'll make a motion to approve it. To, to support, support the bill it. or to support the bill? <laughs> Don't hear a second. Hmm. Okay. Let it lie. Thank you. All right. I'll still I, I'll still check into it, Mr. I, Pre Chairman, and I'll, I'll follow up with you on it. I mean, I can make the motion, but I'm not. I don't know. I mean, I'll make the motion to oppose it and see if there's a second. Second. So now we'll take a uh, vote in uh, opposition of this bill. All in favor say aye. Nope. Do we know enough? Oh, you don't vote then. Do abstention. I don't want to Who's vote. No. I, I mean, I got a little car and didn't even set off some of these dang lights. And you <laughs> sit there for a minute. So I think we got more than a few lights that are messed up. And when I set this a light for a, a minute and a half, I'm going, what's going on here? It's not like I'm in a traffic zone so I mean I guess any more discussion we have a motion on the, the floor and yes director Shaw thank you can we give discretion to oppose um, 
if there is not a significant change from the original bill that I think we would all oppose? <laughs> I don't know. Well, my understanding is not a, there's not an actual law that says that they can run the light right now, is there? No, I, I, I think it, I think it, yeah. it's been the our chief has said that what what they do when a motorcycle is not detected, they were the police officers have discretion to write the ticket or not. And 99% of the time, from my understanding, is if somebody gets pulled over for this scenario, they detect that this is a you know a, a faulty light and they don't issue the ticket. Um, that's at least what our police department says, and then they issue it over to traffic engineering to fix the light. But you know, so there's not a law, it's a discretion of law enforcement. It, the, my fear is, is if discretion, they already have the discretion today, right. then why do we need to put a law in place to just allow it now, when discretion's already given I, to our local law enforcement? I, I agree it's a safety issue, but I wonder why the Chiefs Association changed their position. That That would be, and that's why I'm thinking that perhaps we could give them discretion to oppose depending on their findings I don't know I, I think it's hard because of uh, I don't understand the why they don't turn right the, the, the one technology that's not detected is the little wire that's in the ground if you ever yeah. see those lights and, and most of those do not exist in majority of our jurisdiction you have the white little detector up there right so it does impact you know traffic flow uh, but uh, we, we, we do not experience this issue in our city, so we don't know what the law is solving for except encouraging bad behavior. And, and, and right now, I'm looking at, I'm getting complaints from city already with people running red lights, and now I have somebody where you're cruising down Wadsworth at 45, and you didn't expect that dark motorcycle <laughs> to, to, to shoot out in front of you, when, by the way, we've been having harmonized lights and timing lights there for a reason and soon to be adaptive signals, so. Yes, Director Elrod. Um, I don't feel comfortable codifying something that's just, that's what we do now, so we're going, we're going to codify it without all of the analysis and information to say, is this a good thing or a bad thing? So I would support the oppose it. Any more discussion? We're gonna have to raise hands. So those in favor of opposition, raise your hand. Those opposed? Enough, it's not enough. Only 13. Okay, thank you very much for entertaining that discussion for me. All right, now, Doug. Thank you, sir, very much. And real quick, I. Uh, I want to give you an update on, on uh, some work group activities related to the regional transportation funding options discussion that we had at the last board meeting. You'll recall that we had a readout from the Metro Mayor's Caucus annual retreat in which they explored um, in lieu of, uh, you know, 110 failing and all that kind of good stuff. We're looking, Metro Mayor's has had discussion at the retreat about three three options for possible regional solutions, one being a, a regional transportation authority, the other uh, Metropolitan Transportation District, which is kind of like the RTD model, and the third was to empower an existing um, board and give that taxing authority, um, and uh, that being Dr. Cog, which was, was, was the one that was suggested. So since that time, um, we have had a, we actually met, the work group did er, uh, earlier this week, and uh, we had a very lively discussion, to say the least. I think there was a lot of very, very good conversation, questions that were asked about what we're truly trying to do with this. And I think there's, there's still a lot more discussion that needs to occur on that. Um, we did update the work group. Um, we, we, uh, I've reached out to our legal counsel to seek their opinion about where the appropriate uh, location and statute would be for the creation of potentially giving um, metropolitan planning organizations or councils of governments taxing authority, where would that be placed? And um, uh, our legal counsel agreed, quite frankly, with staff that uh, we believe the intergovernmental relationship statute is the appropriate, pr the appropriate vehicle for that. And um, um, so we had a discussion about that. 
So she, she suggested some language um, uh, as a placeholder right now. So uh, we concluded with that discussion, knowing there's going to be a lot more discussion on the issue, with that we would begin to at least reach out to a legislature, legislator or two um, to request through, I always get this wrong, Rich, legal services. What? Office of Legislative Legal Services to draft some language that we could provide back to the work group for further discussion. Um, and that's kind of where we left it um, with regards to anything to be introduced this year. As you know, we're getting awfully late um, for any, anything like that, um, but uh, we, it's still on the table. But I know there's some angst associated with that, and I will we'll let you guys know that um, you have my commitment that there would be nothing introduced by anybody until there was consensus of this board and a, and a, uh, and a comprehensive discussion on the issue. So, so I hope you take some comfort in that. Thank you, sir, very much. Thank you, Doug. And I, I do encourage that we pay attention to this discussion and then share it with back to our councils and, and a commission. So, all right, any questions? All right, seeing none, let's move on to 15, the overview of TIP. Set aside program schedules and processes, uh, Mr. Rieger. Or attachment at, uh, H. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. I'm also subbing for Todd Cottrell, so I am not Todd. Um, I'm Jacob Rieger, uh, Dr. Cog's Long Range Transportation Planning Manager. So this item is an informational item. We wanted to give you status and update on the work that we're doing to develop the set-asides that are part of the new Transportation Improvement Program, the 2020 to 2023 TIP. So you have already approved uh, these set-asides as part of the new TIP. So what SAF is doing now is actually developing the concepts into sort of actionable programs, and that's what I want to give you an update on. Uh, before I get into individual set-asides, and I will be brief on this item because there's a lot of detail in Attachment H. There's also a table in Attachment H that kind of shows the schedule. One of the things that we're trying to do, so when the new TIP is adopted later this year and these funds become available on October 1st, we don't want to hit the street with, you know, four calls for projects all at once, right? Um, even though the audiences for some of these set-asides are a little bit different, you know, we do want to kind of stage them appropriately. Um, and the table in Attachment H kind of shows that anticipated schedule for each of the set-asides. I just want to give you an overview, a reminder of kind of what these are and where we're at with them. There are some common threads to all of the set-asides. Um, they are competitive, um, and in, in saying that I should say that we actually have five set-asides. One of the set-asides goes directly to the Regional Air Quality Council, um, so we're, we're not talking about that one tonight. We're talking about the other four um, that, that are handled by Dr. Cog's staff. Uh, but each of those four are uh, competitive set-asides. Uh, the fact that they're a set aside, just a reminder of what that means is that literally we're taking money from the TIP and we're setting them aside for a special purpose. So each of these programs has a very specific focus, again, that you adopted as part of the TIP policy of things that we want to emphasize and have a competitive um, project selection for. The other thing that they have in common with one exception is that they're typically two-year calls. So in a four-year TIP, we will typically have two two-year calls, if that makes sense. So on each of the set-asides, with, again, with one exception I'll get to, we are planning that first two-year call on these later this year. Uh, the other thing I'd mention about the set-asides, and we talked about this at the time when you approved them, some of them have been refined a little bit or reconstituted or um, you know, sort of uh, reshaped a little bit. Um, there's one new set-aside, but generally the sort of themes and the set-asides themselves are things that we've had for a very long time in the TIB. Um, but we have updated them in, in the most current tip. So having said that, let me just give you a brief overview of each of the set-asides, and I'll do it in the order that you're likely to see them. Kind of one other common uh, theme between them is that for each set-aside, we have a standard practice for accountability and transparency. When we're developing a set-aside program, we will bring through our advisory committees and to you as the board um, eligibility and evaluation criteria, sort of the rules of the game uh, for each set-aside. So you'll see each of these and actually act on, on each of these over the course of, you know, let's say the next six months. So they'll come back to you individually. So having said that, let me just briefly talk about each of the set-asides, again, in the order that you're probably likely to see them. 
The first one is actually the new set aside uh, for this new tip. It's called the human service set aside. This actually responds to one of the uh, focus areas that you all as the board adopted for the new tip, which was um, increased mobility for vulnerable populations. The human services transportation set aside, as I said, is a new set aside. Um, it's $4 million over four years, and it's meant to do exactly that. It's meant to have better outcomes, more service, um, better accessibility for vulnerable populations, minority, low income, veterans, um, other vulnerable populations, older adults, uh, for transportation. Um, as I said, this is a new set aside. Um, this is also the one exception in terms of that two-year call. We're actually planning the first year of this call, and we're doing it jointly with CDOT in a pilot program that we're really excited about. We're actually with CDOT going to pair um, some Federal Transit Administration funds that they control right now uh, with this human service set aside. We're going to link these together in a joint call um, in the next month or so uh, with the hope that applicants will be able to leverage and combine these funding sources to do the things that we're actually trying to do in this program, which is actually to get better outcomes with existing funding sources, break down silos and barriers around uh, human service transportation. Um, so you will actually see that come to you um, at your April board meeting. So that's the human service set aside. The next set aside that you're probably likely to see is something called the community mobility planning and implementation set aside. This is new in one sense, but it takes parts of, of previous set asides in previous tips. What this one does, it's really focused on uh, sort of, you know, encouraging and rewarding good planning. Um, you know, all of you are doing very good planning in your communities, um, and we wanted to link project implementation to planning. So this really has two parts. It's, um, it's money to uh, do planning studies, small area studies, uh, really to help respond to the outcomes that are appropriate, uh, outcomes of MetroVision that are appropriate in your community. Um, you know, helping to implement the outcomes of MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan uh, through good planning studies and then projects associated with that planning. So if you've already done some good planning and you've got some small infrastructure projects to implement based on that planning process, um, that's what this uh, set aside will do. And you should probably see that in the next couple of months or so. Uh, the third set aside uh, relates to TDM services. Um, again, I think most, most all of you know about a very strong TDM program. This set aside funds three things. It funds our Way to Go program here at Dr. Cog. Um, it funds our regional uh, partnership, our Way to Go partnership with our seven transportation management associations around the region. And then it will also fund non-infrastructure uh, TDM projects. So marketing, education, outreach, information. And we have a legacy of funding those types of projects in the TIP. So this set aside puts those three functions together into a TDM services set aside. Finally, um, regional, tran regional transportation, well, let me make sure I say it right. Regional transportation operations and technology. This is a set aside that we've had for a very long time. What's new this time is that we've kind of added that emphasis and added to the name of technology. So this does several things. Um, it funds the uh, traffic signal, intelligent transportation systems, and other technology projects along with the work that we do as Dr. Cog's staff on the inter interjurisdictional uh, signal timing plan development that we do for your communities. Um, so this is one where we're spending some time kind of further developing that technology component, working with our regional uh, traffic operations working group and other stakeholders. So you'll see this one later this year, uh, but that is our fourth set aside. So with that, I'm just going to stop there and take any questions. Any questions for Mr. Seeing none. Yes, Director Pack. Oh. Um, for the uh, community mobility planning and imp implementation, do you think that first and last mile studies in a city would qualify for that? In concept, yes. Okay. One of the things that we're encouraging, and, and again, that's one of the issues that, that has come up of, of sort of that area of emphasis. Um, one of the interesting experiments we're going to try on this set aside is that we're actually going to ask applicants to give us a letter of interest. So before you go to the trouble of doing you know, a whole application, uh, we want to hear your project proposals when this goes out on the street in a few months, and then actually work with applicants to sort of get the best project possible. You know, you tell us what you're thinking, we tell you what we're intending with the program, and hopefully we come together and meet and get a very good project. So you know, I don't want to weigh in on any sort of hypotheticals in terms of eligibility just yet. 
right. but yes, in concept, those are the types of things we're trying to encourage. Thank you. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Yes, Director Elrod. I have a lot tonight. Good. <laughs> um, I think you just answered my question, but as we're going through our sub-regional um, process now on identifying projects, if there are projects that don't make the list, uh, would be, we be if they meet these qualifications, may we submit them? Yeah, potentially if they meet the, um, the focus areas and the qualifications of the individual set-asides, potentially yes. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much, Mr. Rieger. Next up, community, uh, or excuse me, uh, committee reports. Ron, you're going to give the uh, stack update? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, members of the board, I'll make this. A brief uh, commissioner or director Partridge attended STAC um, at the February 22nd meeting, but he wasn't able to make this evening's board meeting, so asked me to give uh, the brief STAC report. So at the February 22nd meeting of the statewide transportation advisory committee, um, the committee did elect a new vice chair. Um, that is Norm Steen. He's a Teller County commissioner and also the chair of the Pikes Peak Area Council of Governments. Um, the biggest, uh, most significant conversation at STAC uh, was a presentation from the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, CDPHE, on um, low emission vehicle standards and zero emission vehicle standards. So if you'll recall, uh, last year, Governor Hickenlooper um, issued an executive order calling for a low emission vehicle standard that went through the rulemaking process, the Air Quality Control Commission adopted that low emission vehicle uh, rule in November of last year, 2018. Governor Polis, uh, shortly after taking office earlier this year, uh, issued uh, an, an executive order. I think it might have been his first or second executive order uh, around uh, zero emission vehicle standards as well as electric ve electric vehicle electrification of uh, vehicles around the state as a priority. Um, CDPHE is now tasked with developing a proposed zero emission vehicle rule for possible adoption. They're targeting possibly October of this year. Um, they're opening up for public comment and stakeholder involvement in that rulemaking process now. Um, a, a zero emission vehicle rule, if adopted, would apply to manufacturers, not consumers. So it doesn't require you to, to acquire a zero emission vehicle, but it does require manufacturers to make available a certain amount of zero emission vehicles in the fleet that they make available for sale within the state. Um, CDPHE is seeking input from the public online uh, through stakeholder meetings and eventually through an Air Quality Control Commission hearing if that hearing is granted uh, later this year. You can visit the CD CDPHE website for more information on that rulemaking process. Um, the last thing I want to uh, speak to was uh, the Colorado Resiliency Office also provided information to stack uh, at the meeting relating to their work around um, enhancing and improving infrastructure and community resiliency around the state. Uh, they have a number of resources available, particularly focused towards local governments that some of your jurisdictions may be interested uh, in looking at. Uh, they're available at uh, their website, which is uh, coresiliency.com. That's the Colorado Resiliency Office website. They've got lots of resources. I know they're developing some uh, staff present some presentations that are available to local governments as well and piloting some of that. Uh, so that's my brief stack report for this month. Thank you, Mr. Papstorf. Any questions for him? Okay, let's move on to the Metro Mayor's Caucus. And anyone that's been there who wants to weigh in? Mayors, go for it. Metro Mayor's caucus didn't meet last month, so there's no report. Thank you. That was so easy. Um, reports from the Metro Area County Commissioners. Any county commissioner that can weigh in? No oh, meeting, right on. Let's keep moving. Uh, Jayla Sanchez Warren, the Advisory Committee on Aging. Been here. 
So I have two things to tell you about. Every two years, we put out a request for a proposal for our federal and state dollars. Uh, we got 84 requests for funding. Uh, we have a funding subcommittee that is a subcommittee of our advisory committee, uh, a, a representative from each county who painstakingly go through review um, and score these requests. They took their recommendations to the full Aging Advisory Committee, and um, they will put recommendations forward to you, um, uh, and you will look at those next month. So expect those. Um, we are recommending we're recommending to you 74 um, organizations be funded uh, out of these older Americans and state funds for senior services. So um, look forward to that next time. The other thing that we talked about quite extensively is um, the Meals on Wheels program in the south part of the metro area, um, TLC. They're not a contractor of ours, but we do work closely with them. They, have, they serve about 500 people on Meals on Wheels, and they're losing their kitchen. They're currently in Littleton, and they're losing their kitchen. And that's a big concern for all of us on the advisory committee. But we're really lucky because two former board members are on my advisory committee, uh, Kathy Noon, uh, former mayor of Centennial, and Bill Cernanek, former mayor of Littleton. And um, they are coming together. Kathy Noon is actually on the relocation committee for TLC. We really want to partner with them um, because we want those folks who get Meals on Wheels to have them uh, not lose them. We thought it was going to close in March. They got an extension to December, so that gives us some more time. The other thing is, is we are currently having a problem. So we do Meals on Wheels um, all across the region, serving Castle Rock. One of our challenges is to keep the meals warm enough from our central kitchen here in the metropolitan area all the way down to Castle Rock. If we heat them, it's a violation of the nutrition regulations, and it could cause foodborne illness, either if they get too cold um, or, or if the colds get too hot, or if we reheat them. So we really need to find a commercial kitchen in the south part of the region to help us not only serve those 500 people that are currently on Meals on Wheels, expand that, and then make sure that our Meals on Wheels that are being served are safe and not at risk of foodborne illness. So um, we came up with all sorts of ideas. Um, there were some churches identified. There were some places identified, a place in Parker identified that we are going to approach. And uh, we're meeting the second week of April to uh, set up a plan to address this issue. Thank you, Chayla. Thanks. Any questions for her? All right, Doug on the rack. Thank you, sir, very much. Um, we had a board, the, the rack had a board retreat. Uh, it's the first time they've done it in a number of years. Uh, it was, it, we, had, we held it over at Je the uh, Jefferson County offices, um, uh, and uh, we had a very good discussion. It was a six-hour event. We're doing some strategic planning work. I think I got Jerry a new gig with, uh, with the RAC. They want, they're interested in doing a balanced scorecard to kind of get a better understanding of what we are, what our role is, all that kind of good stuff to establish some outcomes. So we're, um, we're excited about that. Um, that's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, E470. Who can speak for E470? No report. Thank you, Director Roth. Any questions for Director Roth? <laughs> um, Why is there no report? No. <laughs> <laughs> Fast tracks. Uh, Director Van Meter. That's not, oh. I'll get the hang of this eventually. <laughs> the RTD board did not have a committee meeting related to fast tracks this month. So the only thing I have of note is that we are making continued progress on the North Metro or N line. The um, overhead catenary, the overhead wires have been powered for the full length of the alignment. And in the near future, we anticipate starting to run trains and start um, our first phases of testing the alignment. So wanted to report that progress. That's it.
Anything on the G line? And the chair. I think the there we have Lee Ridge here. I don't have, have good County. nor bad news to report. No bad news to report. There's oh, actually good news. Good news. No, there's no, good, good news. news. Okay, there is good news. Uh, yeah, your, your uh, flaggers, you I think, can start scaling back now on the on the line, right? I got that notice, so we won't need them out there anymore. They've only been out there for I don't know five years. Right. So. All right, we'll move on. Uh, informational items. Just notice on item 17, the 2018-21 Transportation Improvement Program Administrative Modifications. That's attachment I. Next meeting will be April 17th, but before we move on, member, uh, Thrive is the tent, so please be there. Uh, also, one uh, little housekeeping item, just remember uh, either you as the board member sits at the table or your alternate, but not both of you can sit here. I know there's some new members, and I just wanted to make sure the housekeeping was there. So if you have any questions, give a holler to Doug or Connie. Any other matters by members? All right, don't see any, the meeting's adjourned. <laughs>